and welcome back to Chain Racing, episode 165. Third, so Chrissy Rouse, championship leader. Can he have a look up the inside of Graham Hill? Chasing the racing, powered by Colchester Kawasaki. This, Chrissy Rouse up the inside. He got Callum Bay slightly off line. My name's Chrissy Rouse, I'm 26 years old from a little uh, ex-mining village in the northeast of England, a little place called Burnfield, and I'm currently racing in the British Superbike Championship, number 69 on the BMW, and uh, yeah, it's been a long sort of journey to get up to British Superbikes, obviously through all the, the smaller classes and stuff, and uh, as well as doing the, the racing, I also do a podcast called Chasing the Racing, which is is a weekly kind of informal chat. We'll, we'll get a good range of pretty much anyone from the sport. So we've had obviously our current riders, up and coming riders, riders from the past. And we've also had team bosses, we've had commentators, we've had sponsors. Basically just try, we've had medics, we've had journalists. We just try and get, um, everyone's got a story, everyone's got something interesting to bring. And uh, yeah, we'll just put them out every week and as, as well as that. I also work down in Coventry, uh, so my, my job, my proper title is the franchise manager for Lucas Distribution. So the distribution company is uh, distributing the new BSA Gold Stars, so that's all kind of hotting up and uh, at the moment we're really, really busy with that. So uh, yeah, basically, to put it, to put it in, uh, to wrap things up, I basically just flat out all the time. Do you think that generator noise will get on people's tits or do you think? If you listen to the original file though, so press pause. Yeah, uh, so I've, that's what I mean. I've edited it out as much as I can. But... Yeah. Like the, um, the time. I'm going to have to put some sort of filter on it because it's quite like, like the it in the middle. So my initial interest from racing goes back until I can remember really. So I'm actually the first person in my family to be involved with the sport and to, to race bikes. However, my dad was always an enthusiast. So when he was younger, he, he always, like, as soon as he was 16, he, he got a bike on the roads and then 17. And um, unfortunately, his, I think he always wanted to race himself when he was younger. And looking at the likes of Barry Sheen and, and Alan Carter and people like that growing up, he kind of wanted to be racing himself. But uh, it was just never, I, I guess his his dad wasn't really into bikes and sort of hands-on like that. So it was a case of he, he waited until he got a job and started sort of riding on the roads, but never had the opportunity to race. Um, so from a young age, like my dad had a bike, we used to go out on the road together. Uh, back then, BSB was on uh, BBC, so uh, we used to we used to have one of those tiny little box TVs, you know, the like the brick TVs. Yeah. It only had four channels, and um, obviously BSB was on, on on a weekend, so we'd sit and watch. And I remember at the time, so when I was seven years old, I got my first bike, which. Accidentally, so right behind you there in that little box. That's that's my first bike, my Malaguti 50, which I'm hoping to get restored one day. But uh, yeah, so when I was seven, came down Christmas morning, we had the full Christmas day, uh, got all my presents in. I remember my uncle bought us a helmet, a bike helmet, and, I, and somebody else bought us like bike and top and bike. And, and I'm thinking that's great, but in my head, it never crossed my mind that I was actually gonna get a motorbike as well. So I had all the gear and it got to like the end of the day. And someone, someone came in and we had like a little um, corridor which went down to the front door, and um, I could hear them like sort of. Not, and anyway, my family sort of invited us through, walk through, and there was a Malaguti Fifty Grizzly there. I was seven years old, and uh, that was just like the coolest thing in the world. Well, just I got my van fixed. It'd be really funny if we see. So where, where I used to live, I had a little girlfriend that was the same age as me. And uh, she still lives in that street, so it'd be, it'd be hilarious if we see her. So they, this was the st street that I grew up in, so uh, Willow View. And uh, so I lived here from oh, when I was born till I think we moved when I was, would have, would have been 10, something like that. So all of my sort of like early years and uh, yeah, like running up and down this street, playing, uh, playing football just out the side here. We used to... Me and my mates always used to play cricket here. I don't know how we got away with it, but we used to use this little wall here as the stumps. And then you had a ball, you had a ball from that drain there, 
And uh, yeah, we used to always like smashing cars and that, and then like having to pay, for, having to like knock on the doors and say, oh, sorry, miss, like I've smashed your wing mirror again, and having to pay for them. But once, someone wants to see the window there, someone once put that, uh, like, it's just smashed a ball right through, <laughs> through the windscreen. But uh, yeah, this is my house anyway, I'll show you. So, so six willow view. And then that, that was my room, just upstairs next to the alarm box. And uh, yeah, so like this, this is the first house that, um, when I first got my motorbike, so there's like a little alleyway just in there. Um, and that's where, that's where I got my first Malaguti 50 for Christmas. And uh, yeah, I used to sit in that front living room watching BSB and uh, one day hoping that I was gonna be there racing myself. So uh, yeah, it's mad when, Mad coming back and thinking about it, but yeah, pretty cool. Third, so Chrissy Rouse, championship leader. Can you have a look up the inside of Graham Hill? No. After a few years, I got into uh, motocross racing, and I, I ended up doing that for a couple of years, and ju just racing around the northeast. Wasn't particularly good. I, I, my first ever race, I finished, I was number nine, and I finished ninth, and then uh, I never massively improved. Uh, my best sort of results were kind of like sixth in the northeast. I was never in the sort of front group, no end year challenging for a podium. Um, and yeah, I did, did that for a few years, so 65, small wheel 85. And then when I, when I was on the small wheel 85, at, I think I was 11 year old, my bike was actually stolen from, from my house. And that sort of left a real bitter taste about the, what, what kind of thought would maybe be being followed back from a meeting. And, and then if we'd got another motocross bike, we'd always be just like so nervous that we're gonna get targeted again. and. It's yeah, basically just um, that was that was actually the deciding factor which moved us from racing on the dirt, and just as a fresh start, where we started uh, road racing. So I, my dad got us a little metric at seventy, which um, is well these days you've got fab racing and you've also got like B and B and a few other championships. Back then there was fab racing, racing little metric hits. And um, yeah, that was kind of like start, started a new, turned a new page, if you like, and started the racing on tarmac. The, I think the inspiration behind that was probably, so from those early days when I was first interested in bikes, we used to watch BSB, we used to go to BSB. And I think in the back of my, my mind and also my dad's mind, we'll probably like, one day would love to kind of do BSB. We never had any idea how to get there. We didn't know anybody that did BSB. We didn't know any routes up or whatever, but we just kind of had this like pipe dream. And um, yeah, so that, that started 2008, that was Metric at 70. I did that for like three quarters of the season. And um, so you know, I've got some footage I can maybe share with you from that, but there was the likes of Kyle Ride, Bradley Way, uh, a, a few of the people that, names that you'd still recognize yeah. today, racing racing on these little go-kart tracks. And there was only maybe about 10 of us doing it. And um, at the end of that year, pretty much everyone was moving up to this series called the Aprilia Super Teens. And like I say, me, me and my dad had no idea what it was all about, but if you kind of like, well, what's this all about? People tell you, and then you're like, oh, well, we'll, we'll do it. So um, my dad went down to sort of Preston area and picked up a bike from a guy called Daz Helm. And uh, we just we turned up, I got my ace, my license at Mallory Park at uh, a Thundersport meeting. I still distinctly remember turning up and just like the smell. And back then all of the riders got the same leathers, the same helmet, same gloves, all nitro stuff. I, I remember going and it was um, Fraser Rogers' mom, Sarah, she was handing all the stuff out and uh, getting all kitted up and going out and doing my first few laps. And I just remembered, so it was Mallory Park and it was the first time being on like a bigger bike. I remember coming down on a straight and just as soon as you open it up, the power and like the speed that you just, I mean, what was that, 12 years old, 12, 13, something like that. And just thinking this is just unreal. Um, and then you do your first race. So that, that, that weekend straight into racing at Mallory Park, I was, there was like 44 of us qualified something like 40th like re really close to the back and uh yeah we just had a full weekend of it didn't matter where you were in super teens there was always five other riders that was about the same as you so you d wherever you were in the pack you could have a proper good race and you were learning race craft and and uh yeah that that year we just me and my dad just went as much racing as possible so we did the thunder sport championship 
and then every other every weekend when there wasn't a race on we we're just looking for other club races to do so we ended up uh, my dad was working away as an electrician he, he would go and work monday to friday he would drive home from london on friday night I'd, I'd have stuff ready to go would pack up drive back th usually through the night or get up early get to race tracks and uh, just go and race and it was just the best time ever um and over the course of that season obviously i was getting grad gradually better and um got to the point of not well, winning other club races so like the likes of bempsey and north gloucester and emra and places like that but Thundersport, where the, it was the main championship, like on TV, and it was quite a big deal. We got up to sort of top 10 halfway through the season and then started getting close to like sort of, I think I got a fourth that year, but like fifth, sixth, something like that. So it was, I was really chuffed with that. And then for the following season, I joined a team called uh, JDF, John and JDF, and his bike were immaculate. They're like really good. Basically, we did that to try and win the championship and um, had a brilliant year managed to to win the championship it was the first championship i'd won and um back then the previous super team winners all went on to get rides in like the spanish championships and all like much um like really prestigious rides basically yeah. and just to give you a sort of an idea back then to do the super team championship for one year you it was around sort of thirty thousand quid which for a family like mine was like a massive amount, a huge, huge uh, commitment, massive sacrifice for my parents. And, but it was always, it, it always felt like, well, 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 we don't really have this money to spend, but if we throw everything in and win the championship, then we'll get like taken on by sponsors and whatever. And that just didn't happen. We won the championship and got to the end of the year and there was just not, like literally nothing there. You just had to pay more to go and race at BSB the following season. Um, so we stepped up to 125s, GP 125s, that was the introduction to BSB and then it was kind of just right the way through uh, from from 125s and then there was a competition in the Motorcycle News uh, called the Triumph Young Gun Scheme and um, actually won that, champ that competition which got us a sort of sponsored ride in the Triumph Triple Challenge and then won that the following season and then I went 600s and then I could I could tell you like so much about I could speak forever about all the ins and outs, but um, went ended up doing a little bit of racing in Europe, and then went in two thousand and sixteen. That was my first year on a thousand. Uh, a guy called Russ Owen uh, had a team called Mission Racing, and it was at the point where I was close to to um, being out of the sport, to be honest. So after quite a disappointing season on a six hundred, the I sort of felt like I'd given it a good check the shot and nothing was really happening for us. And at the so I wasn't going to be racing in 2016 and at the last minute Russ came in. He had a BMW thousand, he had a truck, he had this infrastructure, but he didn't have a rider. So it was a case of I I was basically paying all my running costs and he was providing the truck and the, the bike. And um, that worked out really well. And from then, we had some real good results. Rode again for Russ the following year, and we we're getting we we're getting podiums at uh, BSB. And then from then, we've, I've been super stock up to super bikes for a short period, back to super stock. Uh, I ended up winning the super stock championship with Crow Performance, and uh, in 2020. And then uh, following season, I, I signed for GR Motorsport to stay in the same championship. So basically defending the number one championship and uh, that was on a, a Kawasaki and just had a disaster season uh, I went from averaging I think I was averaging uh, 18 points a race the year before and then I, I averaged nine points a race the following season so it's like a, a huge difference yeah um, and yeah for whatever reason that just didn't work out and um, got to the end of that season because I'd already won the Superstock championship I, f I thought myself I could stay in Superstock and then end of that season, then I could do Superstock again. And I thought, I'm, at this rate, I'm just basically going to be a Superstock rider and stay in Superstock. And I really want, it's, from being a young age, like I said before, my dreams to be in British Superbikes and be a rider in British Superbikes. So um, I spoke back to the, the team that I was with in 2020. And then um, Gabriel from Crow Performance, it was actually his bike I borrowed in 2020 to win the championship and um, sort of floated the idea of potentially uh, going super bikes with the same sort of setup. So very much like a privateer team, 
Um, and yeah, we had a few meetings early on in the sort of early on in the, the in the year, if you like, the calendar year. Looked at what we would we need to do. It was we're catching up on Zoom, and first of all, we're looking at the budget, and uh, we made a big sort of detailed spreadsheet of all the costs of going superbike racing, and um, it sort of it it worked out that mass I would have to bring around. Uh, ten thousand pounds a race a, a weekend sorry to to make it happen and um that's obviously not the full cost that's very much um so the team providing the bike the uh, that was working on the basis of m most of the team being volunteers nearly all the team was volunteers all that sort of stuff so it was like i say not the not the full cost but that's what would cost priced it up as and then obviously it was a big job to then go and speak to all my sponsors to try and work out whether we could commit to that and um yeah we we went for it and quite a few quite a few people at the time and since have uh, told us that they think I'm making a big mistake and they think I'm crazy for doing for committing to that but it's um I'm absolutely loving what we're doing it's it's unbelievably difficult, like to to turn up and race in BSB. Anyways, the, the level of competition is so high, um, but to be doing it as a as a small sort of independent private team, and um, it's it yeah, it's, there's a massive sort of sense of purpose. And when we turned up at the first round, and you know, I'm not I'm not being biased, but when you see the bike and all the, the garage box and the, the leathers and everything the whole the whole thing looks immaculate and i'm like so proud of the the small group of people that have uh well i say small group of people in the team but there's a massive group of people helping us to do that um to start obviously all my personal sponsors jumped jumped in and uh, very generously helped us helped us sort of make that dream a reality but as well as that there's a there's a large group of people that maybe don't have businesses, but that they wanted to, to help out and to help us uh, get to super bikes. So I run something called a supporters wall. So it, within my garage, uh, they'll, I've got a big supporters wall. People send pictures of themselves, of the dogs, or the bikes, or the kids, or whatever. And um, that's that's been, to be quite honest, we wouldn't actually be able to race this year without that sort of support. So yeah, it's um, it's a proper it's a proper journey and it's like i say it's incredibly difficult but when when i think about there's like 68 million people in the in the country and there's 31 people lining up to do bsb and out of every I, if i could choose anything to be doing with my life it would be to be racing in bsb at the moment um so I, in my head i think i'm kind of like i'm 31 of six, 68 million people and um days like say brands hatch you uh, that last weekend you're lining up the sun shining you're standing on the grid all the cameras the tv the you know, i was like 17th on the grid so like right in the <clears throat> middle of the pack the grandstands are packed there's uh, I, I later found out that there's like three hundred and seventy thousand people watching live on tv and i'm just i'm like pinching myself at like at like I can't actually believe how like fortunate I am to be doing this. Um, yeah, in the in the famous words of a good friend of mine, Andrew Lund, I was just thinking like, what could possibly be better than this? Like, it's just so good. But obviously, with that comes a lot, comes a lot of stress and the pressure and yeah, like even just like the financial strain. It's really really difficult to make this possible. Obviously, when you when you think of numbers like ten thousand pounds per weekend um it's yeah it's massive um but it's you know, we've committed to it we're going after it and um I'm, I'm a big believer in life like it's so easy to sit back and just think like can't and make excuses and block things out and like you're not good enough or whatever but there's some there's something special about sort of chasing a dream and just even if the numbers don't add up and the you know, realistically, it maybe doesn't sound like a great idea. There's something special about chasing a dream that like, almost feels impossible, just going after it, putting everything into it. And whatever then happens, you know, is kind of irrelevant. I think it's like the, 
having having something to aim for and going for it that's kind of the the most important thing i often get asked what i enjoy most about racing or which um does it does racing make you happy and it's a funny one because there's there's no part of the weekend which you sit back and you think this is this is brilliant i'm really enjoying myself but when you come away from the weekend or when you reflect on what you're doing as a whole there's there's a massive sense of purpose and drive and yeah i'd say purpose is probably the best thing so i enjoy i enjoy the challenge of racing and i enjoy the challenge of of the whole thing really like just um the whole project but there's no particular part which i think i sit back and enjoy myself it's much more it's like a deeper thing than just enjoying it yeah it yeah you're just so f focused and it it means so much that it's just yeah it's difficult to, to describe in words but it's not it's not like enjoying it like You'd enjoy going on holiday. You'd enjoy having like meeting up with your friends and going like going out or whatever. That's like there's no sort of stress and pressure in that enjoyment. Where this is, it's much more important. It mean means a lot to you. And you're putting everything into it, but there's something special about doing that. That that's the that's like the sort of magic in it. It's not. It's not like enjoying it, like, ah, this is great. So you, you can have a whole weekend where you don't smile or you don't, but it's a good weekend if you get the result. So it's a difficult one to say that. The enjoyment of, of racing or the bit that you enjoy the most is is when you're club racing, whether it's just with your mates or with with your parents or whatever, whoever you, you're going with, and it's all for fun. When, as you, the further you go up, and obviously I'm not, like you'd have to say, MotoGP's the pinnacle, BSB's like, it's a good, very good level, but it's not as far as you can go. But th as you go up that ladder, it, it definitely becomes less about enjoying it and more about you, you're there to, to get a result, you're there to do the best you can. It's a little bit like, do you know if you said to like a professional footballer, do you enjoy playing in the World Cup? They're, they're there to like, it's a massive thing for their life. And it's something that they'll look back on, they're really proud about. It's an achievement that everyone wants to do. But you wouldn't enjoy going out to play in the World Cup. You, but you're not there to enjoy it. You're there to try and get a, it's Yeah, yeah that, that's kind of what it's like. In terms of the highlights of my racing career, so well, there's been three championships. All three of them are sort of special to us for different reasons. So the first one was the Aprilia Super Team Championship. That was the first championship I won in 2010. And that was, that was like at the time, that was just the best thing ever. A really, really, uh, really good championship to win. The following championship I won was the called the Triumph Triple Challenge. And that was in 2013. And um, again, for different reasons, that was a BSB. It was like live on TV. And yeah, it was a, another good stepping stone, I think, for us. And then it was actually quite a long, a long way. So from, from winning races in 2000. 13 when I won the championship I didn't win another race until 2019 so it was six full years uh, almost to the day as well that I that I I went on like a dry spell if you like obviously I was going up at like harder championships but still it's a long time ago racing without getting a race win and I got my first race win on the Morello Kawasaki in 2019 and then in 2000 and uh, 20 that was my next championship so a core performance in national superstar champion and um that was awesome uh yeah there's there's actually a film called chasing the championship which is out on uh it's on amazon prime and a few other places which is basically follows that whole story but in terms of the ups ups and downs that whole story started with a massive injury and losing my ride and then had to borrow my, my friends by gabriel and um, it was just a very small, small independent team again, but we'd, we just went out and again, it felt like sort of giant killing. We're against big, big established teams and we just went out and uh, got stuck in and obviously won the championship. So that was amazing. But def by, by far the best single experience, best single moment that I've had in racing by a country mile was uh, comes in 2009. 
and it was at Snetterton uh, MRO meeting. It was quite early on in my sort of racing, road racing career. And um, my, at this point, my best result was fourth, fourth position. And I missed the Friday practice day because my dad was working. So finished work Friday, we drove down to Snetterton through, I can't remember if it was through the night or early or whatever, but got up, got the bike out, got it scrutinized and went out, I qualified sixth and we came in and I think that was my best qualifying at the time. So like, we're like chuffed a bit. But in my head, I remember thinking like, that was a shit lap. And I was, I'm six, so I was thinking, I'm, you know, like I can get stuck in here. Yeah, I felt really good. And then, got off the start and my ex going into that race I'd never really thought about where I wanted to finish but my best result was fourth up to then so if if I'd got a third that would have just it would have been my first ever podium it would have been brilliant and um off straight off the start from six on the grid I got the whole shot and it was the first time I'd ever so, so sorry I, I didn't get the whole shot in the turn one but then dived on the brakes in the turn two at Snedden and um, it was the first time I'd ever led a race and there's a few sort of good points here, but this race in general is my, my highlight. And um, it was the old Snetterdon, so you used to go fast turn one, it was like a 90 degree turn two, and then it's the longest straight in the country, so it's 0 0.9 kilometers, 900 meters. And on a, on these little 30 horsepower Aprilia's, that just seemed to go forever. And anyway, I, I went up the inside, stood the bike up, and I just remember getting tucked in, going down the straight, check. And at first I thought to myself, like, has there been like a red, like I thought there'd been a red flag or something. So I'm looking and I could hear the bikes behind us. I thought, no, no. And I just goosebumps and like tucked in, squeezing the tank as hard as I could. And my instant thought back then was, bloody hell, like when I get to the, when I get back to the pits, I'll be able to say to my dad, like I was, I was actually leading the race. And like I was, went down the straight, broke, I was still leading. I came round, um... I think Alex Vallard maybe overtook us on the, uh, on the straight and then I got him back going through Coram. And I, so I remember going into the last corner at Snedden and leading. It was like where my mum was watching. I knew she, was, she would be watching there as well. So I was like chuffed a bit. Got the bike stood up and at Snedden and you, got, you come out of the last corner and then there's like a little kink right. And I, I distinctly remember going, so opening the bike up second, third, fourth, and then just turning right and just seeing my dad's face on pit lane. So like, I'm like coming up the wall. Back then we used to get as close to the wall as possible, almost so that people couldn't put the pit boards out. But there was some, I don't, people do it now even. Apparently you get like a better slipstream if you're close to the wall. So it's right tight against the wall. And I just remember looking up and seeing my dad's face and just him just, uh, it was just a blank expression. Like you just didn't know. And like I was, there was me and him. We're just looking at each other, and I'm thinking like, there's like thirty kids behind us, and just think like, it was just amazing. And then Alex, going on that second lap, like three people passed us at once, and I remember I remember them going past and, and taking a deep breath and thinking, right, like let's settle into the race and let's see if I can like hold on to them. And straight away, I kind of got back in front, and and after five or six laps, I realised that like I had the same pace as them. And we ended up having a ba battle right to the finish line. I, I led out of the last corner and all the way up the straight, I could hear a bike just pull me alongside. And as we got to the line, we just crossed and I, I won the race by like nothing. Like zero point whatever, zero or something. And um, yeah, just did the worn down lap. I was just beaming. Came in the pit lane, went up to the top. I remember there was, I used to race with a guy called Ty Jones and his, his dad, Jeff, was the first person to speak to us. He came over and he got a, an old scrap of piece of paper out and asked for my signature. And um, I, I, I don't think I'd ever signed a signature before and my hands were shaking, I signed it. And um, it's just a side note, he, he laminated that and gives it back years later and I used to keep it in my leather. But, um, and then my dad came over and I, my dad said, I don't, he said, um, son, I don't love you anymore because you just won that race. But that was fucking amazing or something like that and just gives a hug and, and it was for me that was like such a step going from it, was, it genuinely felt like going from like a non-winner to being a winner and that it was a huge switch uh, i think it, it it probably had like knock-on effects for my confidence for everything i think it was it, it it's mad how like a sport can do that but when 
once you get that win, you then you feel you, you're somebody and you, you've got like a bit of swag about you and you start believing in yourself and and um, yeah, and it just go went for a meal that night and just I was literally just on cloud nine. It was just and you, for months months to come. I was just buzzing and uh, yeah, that was definitely. And I think that will always be the best moment of my life. So I think with within any sport, but especially with racing, there's always there's ups and downs. Or like look at any single person's career, nobody it's plain sailing for. Obviously, for some people it's rougher than others. And um, but yeah, it's such a it's such a edge of the seat sport that you know, like with injuries, there's obviously the financial element. The, there's lots of like sort of luck being in the right place at the right time, getting like good sponsors, getting good opportunities. Um, in terms of in terms of my own sort of journey through and looking back, I guess I was really close to stopping racing in 2015. So I'd raced a National Superstock 600s uh, for Harry Bow Starmix Triumph. So team was sponsored by Harry. We used to, we used to give out like five, six thousand packets of Haribo sweets a weekend. Um, but at the end of that season, I'd finished ninth in the Superstock Championship. Really, really, like I went into that season fully expecting to challenge for the championship. I'd done everything I could. I trained really hard. I'd, you know, I, I was put my heart and soul, heart and soul into that year, and finished ninth in the championship. No podiums. Like it was just a complete disaster. And it got to the end of that season and I was just kind of thinking like, we'd raced for years, you know, I'd had, I'd been, I'd had like some really good opportunities and I really just thought to myself, I've given it my all and I'm just not good, good enough to go to the next step. And I guess lots of people could probably resonate with that. Other racers who are coming through, they're probably feeling like that. And it got to the end of that season and I just, I thought to myself, there's no way I'm going to then be racing the following season. I'm not... I'm not going to do the same championship. I'm not going to step up because it's even harder at the next level. And I'd sort of accepted in my head that I'd just I'd given it a go. It wasn't going to work out, and I'd I sort of put the race into one side. And it was it was around the time that I think Tinder was quite early in its thing, and I just ended up going. I was on Tinder all the time and just going on dates and just going out in Newcastle all the time and just kind of put the I really tried to just put the racing in the back seat and that's the only time like through my life where I've actually where racing hasn't been the epicenter of, of my focus really and um, it got like months so like right way through the off season I wasn't really training wasn't like preparing to race I just kind of thought I wasn't gonna be racing next year got to February just before the season started and I had a call from a guy called Jay from this team that I didn't even know called Mission Racing and the following week we kind of met up and to be honest I, I'd spoke to a few teams before where they're just um, a bit of a women of prayer and like just I just didn't think you know I, I didn't have particularly high hopes when I went for the meeting I just thought I like we may as well sort of see what they've got to say but and it just it was the timing of it was just perfect because what they were looking for and what I was looking for and, and it was just like well let's let's have a bash type of thing and I went into that season with like really low sort of expectations. I didn't even have expectations. Went to the first race. We stopped off on the way down at Snetterdon to do a track day. And then just went straight to Silverstone. And the bike at the time, sorry, the first time we rode it had electronic suspension. We bought a second hand um, Bacubo suspension, front and rear. I still remember it was like 1600 quid. The bike, we didn't have a, nobody really in the team had a clue about the bike. We didn't have a mechanic. So at the time, a guy called Neil Pearson, who was working for another team, was finishing up with his rider, and then on the night time, he was coming around and just making sure my bike was okay. Um, it was really like just me and my mates sort of thing. And um, that was at first. Neil did actually join us a few rounds in and was a great mechanic for us. And uh, yeah, we ended up just having a great season. That very first weekend, I think F, FP2 or Q1 or something it was a wet session and uh, I don't even think I had a pit board and I came in and I was P4 and this was after finishing ninth in Superstock the year before I was kind of expecting to step up to Stock 1000 and be 25th-ish like around there 
and yeah, I just sort of gelled with it straight away. First race, I missed the start of the race, so I had to start from dead last on the grid, and I finished like 11th or 12th or something like that. And then just ever since then, just really got stuck in on this on the thousands. Loved the thousand from the first time I rode the bike, and um, I don't know if I was just lucky that I gelled with that that bike, that team, or whether I, I really don't know, but. Um, yeah, just since then, absolutely loved it. Like I said, did two years with Mission Racing, had some of the best times ever. And um, it was very much just like, it felt like giant killing because we were this small independent team with like a really low budget. Back then I was going out against people who had sort of watched on TV and grown up looking at and were like prop. And to be honest, looking back, I was maybe a little bit, oh, I don't know if you'd say over aggressive, but I was definitely loose because I just, I didn't have the skill and the expect, the experience, but I had the will. And so I just wanted to, want, even if I even if I didn't have the pace of the person in front, that didn't stop, so I just went for it anyway. And um, it got us, it got us into a little, like a few, a little bit of bother a couple of times, but I just, I, I loved it. I loved being near the front of Superstock and like proper getting stuck in. And it, yeah, it was just brilliant. And, um, uh, yeah, it, what, going back to like enjoying it, those were the times that like I in, actually enjoyed racing the most because there was obviously there was still a little bit of pressure. Obviously, if I crashed the bike, I still had to pay for it, so it was, I still had that financial pressure, but nowhere near what it is now. And um, yeah, I was like at the time I was working at Nando's, I was at university and racing stock thousand at the time, and it was just brilliant. And yeah, I loved it. So Chasing the Race in the, the podcast that I do alongside Dominic Herbertson, uh, we started three, I think it was three years ago, something like that. Uh, we're up, in fact, it'll be more than three years ago, yeah, three and a half years ago, I think it is now. Um, we started basically just as like an informal chat. It was really basic when we started. So we, we used to record it in Dom's sister's house, just at, his t at a table, two microphones, no cameras or anything. And then it developed, we started recording it with cameras in my, my parents had like a little camper van at the time. So we used to set a little, a little studio up there. We did a, another probably 20 or 30 episodes in there. And then uh, at the time we had like a little box trailer, which we used to use for, for racing and whatever, just really basic, uh, shut the door on the back and just an empty box trailer. And my, a good friend of mine, Lundy, uh, kits out uh, like VW camper vans. He's really, really good at it. Each one of them's different. He doesn't like just he doesn't just build like an average thing to spec or to order. He, he, each one like he's really creative with it, and then just puts it up for sale, and someone and then people end up buying them. And um, I asked him for a price to to kit that out, and um, Drew, drew like something really basic. So I, I said, I want a, a seat with two chairs, which also turns into a bed. And it also needs, I also need to be able to get my motorbike in. And uh, like a few, I said, there'll be a camera here, camera here, camera here, lights, whatever. And um, that was it, just, just left it in to get on with it. And then maybe a month or two later, I went back and um, that the, he's actually got, a, a, so he set cameras up for when we went in and uh, it was just absolutely blew us away. It was amazing what he did. Um, yeah, just exactly what we're after, but it was just the quality of it was just amazing. And um, I don't know if I don't know if he'll mind us saying this, but he, uh, I went to pay. It. So basically, I priced it up on. I told him the the dimensions, and the trailer was like much. I miscalculated it massively. So. It was priced up on like a much smaller trailer, so it ended up being a massive job for him. He did the whole thing, and um, wouldn't he didn't charge us for it. All what he wanted us to do was uh, to to raise some money and to promote um, for Macmillan Cancer Care, and um, which it just goes to show like what a, a cracking bloke he is. And um, it, without that, that, that's just been amazing for the podcast. It's when you think of all of the people that we've had in there over the over the years. Um, yeah, it's it, and obviously I I live in it as well when, when I go BSB racing, so that turns into like my motorhome. home. So the, uh, to be honest, I probably spend more nights on that bed than I do my bed at home. 
in a year. So um, yeah, just go everywhere in it. If we've been broken in twice, been burgled twice, um, but luckily, luckily we're, nobody's actually towed it away. It's just been um, yeah, like smashed the back door in. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's just been brilliant. And then obviously every week we get a podcast done. It's difficult because obviously myself and Dom are really busy with our racing and with our jobs. So to like coordinate and with coordinate with the guest. So often it's very sort of, uh, I'll just, he might have one evening and he's free and then we'll, we'll sort of coordinate it and we, we'll get it done. So it's difficult, but um, yeah, every week one goes out every Sunday and um, I basically, so after the podcast, I do a very small amount of editing, just the audio, and I send that to my little sister Grace and then my, my sister Grace looks after everything else with the podcast, so she does, um, She's obviously still at school, so she's uh, she's kind of does it around her homework and whatever. But she looks after the editing for the video, which is quite a big job, obviously. Puts that on YouTube. It puts the audio across all of the platforms, which if there's like hundreds of platforms that it goes out on. And then also looks after the the Facebook, the Twitter, and the Instagram. And uh, yeah, it's um it's kind of grown into something quite big. I think it's probably the biggest of its kind. It's probably like the biggest thing in the world for. Uh, in the, I know it's quite a niche thing, like the sort of bike racing and interviewing people, but um, yeah, it was recently just hit two million uh, unique views, downloads, and uh, we're average. It averages out at about three and a half thousand people a day watching, watching or listening to the podcast. So when you stop and actually picture that many people, it's a lot, um, and it's just grown all the time. Just, and I guess that's. There's a lot that goes into it, but obviously it wouldn't be anything with without the guests that we have on. And uh, yeah, we're very lucky that you know some people are willing to come on and share sort of interesting stories. And yeah, it's a lot of the time it's the highlight of my week, especially in the off season when when you're not getting a racing fix um, to kind of just talk about something you're passionate about. It's great, and um, yeah, I think the podcast probably opened up a lot of doors for us as well with I don't think I'd probably be able to race and do what I'm doing now with the superbike job without the podcast because um I think there's a lot of individuals that help us out to maybe know us through the podcast or have met through the podcast and also sponsors and so yeah it's it's been a, a fantastic thing for us really and uh, yeah, I'm very I feel really, although it takes a lot of work to do, I feel really privileged that we'll get the chance to do it. In terms of my aspirations for this season, obviously running as privateer in superbikes, I'm reasonably happy with how things are going so far. The, the first sort of half of the season was massively hampered by something that was was out of my control. So the, the very first, well, just to start off with the very first race of the season my engine blew up which was a big hit for us so we're running on a, a, a different sort of a less spec engine and then the se second race of the season unfortunately uh, another rider crashed right in front of us left us nowhere to go hit the brakes as hard as i could but i did, could, couldn't miss it and um had a really heavy impact on my head uh, knocked us out at the time which obviously meant i missed the, the next race the third race it also meant meant I missed the next test at, St at uh, Alton Park. But for, for weeks, if not months, it massively affected us. Um, even like months later, I would I was like going to sleep. Every time I went lay down, my head was spinning. And it took us a long time to start feeling like myself again. So that that ha hampered the, the start of the season. But um, since then, I'm... I, I, I'm quite happy with with how I've been getting on. I'm just kind of in that gap. My goal is to obviously get points, and um, I'm I'm in and around that area. I've had a, my best position was tenth position at Donington, which I was really really happy. Obviously being in the top ten, and if I can have a few more of those that this year, that would be great. But uh, I'm very realistic about where we are. You know, I've got the the bike itself is is it's a brilliant bike. Um, and I'm really grateful for, for the team for, for buying that bike for us. Um, in terms of the spec of the bike, it's, um, it's like the engine is a, a super stock spec engine. So there is, there is more that we could potentially be doing. And when I look at the, the riders ahead, it's, I, I am aware that there's, 
there's definitely things that I can do to improve my riding, but I, I genuinely believe if you put the, like, whoever you class as the best rider in the championship, let's say Tyron McKenzie or Jason O'Halloran or something like that, if you put them on my bike, you know, I, I don't think they'd be winning. So I, we don't have, like, a race winning package, but when you look at the budgets that are required to be a race winning package, it's it's massive money. So I, I feel we're doing the, the best that we can. And my my goal is to... It's funny, beginning of the season, nobody actually asked us this question, but in my head, I thought to myself, if I can average one point a race, so therefore 33 races, 33 points. Um, and so far, I'm ahead of schedule with that. So, I've, yeah, if I'm in and around the points, getting stuck in, if I'm beating any of the factory-backed riders and the factory-backed teams, that to me is like a massive win. Um, and yeah, if just if I can just carry on learning. Every weekend I'm going to, I'm not riding above my limits. I'm riding well within my limits, but enough that I'm learning. So obviously if you could just toodle around at the back, you wouldn't be learning anything. You know, if you're just smashing yourself up and crashing, you're not really learning anything. So there's a careful balance, but um, yeah, if I can if I can stick on the back of those top experienced riders and teams and learn learn the bike, learn the tires, I think it puts us in a real good stead. In terms of for, for next year, I've got no idea. I've really enjoyed the, the challenge of being heavily involved with running the team and all the ins and outs that goes with that. I don't enjoy receiving all the invoices after a weekend. I think that, that's the bit that I, I think I could do with do with changing. But um, whether we'll look to do something similar next year and have our own setup and uh, get some sponsors on board to, to in order to do that, I th I'd I would love to do that and I, I would enjoy the challenge. But, but also if there's opportunities to, to go with uh, established teams, um, I'm ob I'll obviously have to look at those options as well. And uh, yeah, I guess my, my long-term goal of... Um, of working my way up and be getting close at the front in superbikes. Like I said, there'd be something great about doing it as a small knit team and like the, the team I work with now and the people that help us out, they're such a fantastic group. Um I'd I'd love to pursue that and keep going. But obviously it's the, the it's a very, very expensive sport. And um yeah, at the moment I feel there's a lot of people that have sort of went above and beyond to help us out for this year but I'm not sure how sustainable that is going forward so yeah I'm, I'm always on the hunt for for uh, obviously sponsors to to join and we'll have everything laid out we've we've got the, the um, all the main ingredients that we need going forward so if there was financial backing to do it ourselves I, I'm in a position to, to do that but if if not, then uh, we'll just look at other things. So yeah, I'm I'm really concentrating on what we're doing this year at the moment. I'm not I haven't started looking at anything for next year or speaking to anybody, but um, it's always like in the back of your mind.